uh, might be full. All right. Well, um, uh, we are uh, here for the Power of Place uh, lecture, and we have Vivian here and Liz. Uh, Liz is the um, the lab director for uh, for Montpelier Archaeology, and Vivian is a is a longtime expeditioner. Okay, come on, many many programs, and really excited to have you all uh, come on this. Um, and Rick and Lori, looking forward to meeting you and Leontony and Lyle. Be great to see you all as well. And uh, Jane, um, uh, you're inside the lab right now, so you know all this. But uh, um, what we're um, uh, going to do is give you a brief introduction to the uh, the property here at Montpelier. And then, um, Liz, you're going to be giving out the schedule. Or Have you sent out the schedule yet, or is that something... Mm -hmm. Not yet, but uh, I can do that today. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah, Liz has yeah. made a an incredible uh, schedule for the this three day expedition, uh, being on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And um, you know, Rick and Lori, if you have any questions about um, you know, uh, what what to expect, feel free to give Liz or I a uh, a call or an email. So, um, but yeah, for the with the power of place, what we um. Uh, want to do is provide a, a context for the landscape at Montpelier and the depth of archaeological research that we've done over the past three decades and to really situate the the um, this equestrian uh, history program and archaeology program into into what we what we know in the property as a whole and obviously when you're here you're going to be able to see a lot of these sites, but seeing it in a map overview is uh, just sometimes uh, very helpful. So what I will do is I'll go ahead and, uh, or before I start, Vivian, do you have any questions about the program? No, I'm waiting to see what you guys have out there for it. Okay, awesome. I'm a former equestrian myself. Yeah. That my last course was a steeple chaser. You're going to have some great perspective on all this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's called, you know, you sit there and scream when you're going over some of the big jumps. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and share screens. And what I'm going to do is just give a very brief overview of uh, some of the archaeological and landscape uh, context. So we'll share screen one here. And uh, this is an overview of the uh, the property right here uh, that you can see on the on the map. Uh, let me hide floating meeting controls. There we go. All right, and you all can see the map. Cool. And so Montpelier consists of around 2,650 acres, and the brown line is the outline of what today is the property that's owned by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And back in the day, what was, you know, in the 18th and early 19th century, up until the period that Dolly Madison sold the property in 1844, the two pieces that were uh, Montpelier property was uh, this deed plat right here, which you can see an 1844 plat for, and then this uh, deed right in this area. So this was the contiguous property of uh, Montpelier. And um, uh, today, what the National Trust owns is land that was um, acquired by the DuPont family in the early 20th century. So today, Montpelier consists of about three different plantation boundaries that once made it made up the landscape in the 18th century. And that's what these land masses uh, reflect. And for the um, for the early history of Montpelier, you know, Montpelier is situated in the uh, in the in the the western end of Orange County. This blue outline is is Orange County, and then of course Orange County within Virginia is what's termed Central Virginia. So we're right. Orange County is right here. Um, uh, Richmond's down here. Washington D.C. is up in here, and then um, Culpeper is down in in this area. And this part of Virginia originally was um, uh, was inhabited by the Manahoac, um, uh, uh tribe, and they were kin to the um, Monacan tribe. Uh, and in the, in the late 18th, late 17th century, the Manahoac were absorbed by the Monacan, and so their tribal area was in this uh, um, this Western Piedmont area. And for today, the, the property that we've got uh, that makes up Montpelier 
We we're really focused on the early 19th century history of Montpelier, and this is the period for which um, we've uh, re re restored the main house. So this is what the how the main house appears today in its 1820s uh, restored period, and a lot of the the buildings and the sites we've focused on over the past 20 years relate to this early 19th century period. But as, you know, archaeologists, when we're working on a site, you know, we don't have a choice o over what period we're going to be uh, we're going to be encountering because it depends on what was there in the past. So this is where, you know, we're interested in everything from the uh, period of indigenous occupation with the Manahoac all the way into the 20th century, because we're finding these sites uh, as we as we do the archaeology all across the property. And we've over the past 30 years we've uh, we've um excavated literally tens of thousands of units across the property so if you look at the main house right here and i zoom in what you can see all the is all these little uh um five by five squares each is the of these is a five foot by five foot square we've excavated all of what's called the south yard where um all the uh the buildings that were uh, uh, you know attached to the main house the kitchens, the smokehouses, the homes for enslaved families are located. All this is based on excavations that we've done. And in the process of doing these excavations, looking for these this early 19th century landscape, what we found is everything from, you know, 18th century buildings that date to um, the, uh, the Revolutionary War period. So, for example, for the main house right here, the original part of the main house was um, between the two single chimneys. This is the part of the house that was built by enslaved masons in the 1760s. So in doing archaeology in this space, we found everything for the main house, everything from the mid-19th century all the way into the period of the DuPonts when these large additions were added onto the back of the house. So we've got to really be fluent in all of this history. And what it's led to through the years is really a, a, a much more interesting understanding of the property than if we were just exclusively focused on this 1820 to 1844 uh, time period that we're restoring to. And so what, uh, and this really is, has led Liz into some of the studies that she's done on the, uh, on the equestrian history of Montpelier spanning from the early 18th century all the way up until the present day. And with the present day, uh, and you all are going to be here for this, I, I just realized when I was looking at the aerial, this Google aerial map happened to have been flown. Um, let's see that. Let me see when this was flown. Yeah, this was, we were out at the overseer's house at that time. So this, this aerial must have been flown in either um, the um, November, late October of 2021 or 2022. Um, and what you can see is all the tents for the races right here. So this is what you all are going to be experiencing when you get here. When you drive down Center Road on Wednesday um, evening, you're going to see all these tents in front of the main house. And uh, this is the president's tent of which you'll be partaking on, on Saturday. And the finish line is uh, is uh, is right uh, right here for the uh, the races. So you're you're going to be front and center for for all of this. And then these are all the vendors tents along here. And, and then we've got um, all of the patrons tents all along the rails through here. So this, the, the landscape at Montpelier is one that, you know, it, it, we've got all these periods represented. And um, uh, in terms of the, the visitor core, where most visitors uh, come, you know, with the visitor center being kind of in the middle of all of this, um, the visitor center and parking lot is situated within this you know, real r focus on this early 19th century landscape, but again, with all these 18th to 19th century components. So kind of moving through time with this, um, one of the earliest sites we've got at Montpelier is down in what we call the home farm complex is what is the, uh, the Mount Pleasant site. And the Mount Pleasant site is the, um, the original uh, um, home 
for the Madisons when uh, they had the enslaved set up the plantation here at Montpelier. And this this um, this site is one that we've done a lot of archaeology in the 90s and early 2000 aughts to uncover the main house and the uh, um, the outbuildings associated with this. And the this this um, artist rendering of Mount Pleasant uh, shows what this site would have looked like in, in around the 1740s, 1750s. And all this is based on, based on archaeology. But at this site, this was, um, uh, occupied uh, primarily uh, by Francis Madison in terms of uh, who who was around at the time from the, from the Madison family. Francis Madison is the grandmother of President James Madison, and she ran the plantation um, as a widow uh, following the death of her husband Ambrose Madison in 1732, up until her death in 1762, and um, during this time period. Tobacco was the, uh, the, the major crop for cultivation during this time period. And so most, most of the tobacco cultivation that occurred at that time, whether being plow based, was um, uh, sw uh, uh, Swidden based with, with uh, um, uh, you know, hilling the soil into uh, tobacco hills and really some rudimentary clearing of the, uh, the land. And um, it was only in the 18th century that you begin in, in the time of the American Revolution that you get into more large scale plowing of the landscape. But for this early 18th century period, Mount Pleasant is the main site that we've got that shows this colonial era history um, at Montpelier. And again, for this site, we've got very little you know, in the way of documentary records, but it's the archaeology that that um, really allows us to flesh out some of the details. And the, right next to the Mount Pleasant site is the uh, the Madison Family Cemetery. And the Madison Family Cemetery is really the only visible part of the built landscape that's in this part of the uh, of the of the uh, of the of the plantation. And this consists of the brick wall and then the uh, um, mid to late 19th century tombstones. And, of course, Madison's obelisk that was put up in 1854 out here in this area. So um, for Mount Pleasant, what it's also adjacent to is this larger farm complex that we've been looking at over the past uh, decade. It's been in some of our more recent um, studies. And for the for the home farm complex, this is the area that is um, uh, just down the hill from the uh, visitor center parking lot. So you can see the main house in the upper left of the, uh, the photo right here. And then all these fields in here were at one time this, um, this uh, complex of buildings that uh, would have appeared something like this. So kind of getting, kind of doing a comparison here. This is a, a 3D rendering of the, um, of the farm complex of how it would have looked in the 1820s. And you compare it to the modern day landscape. This building right here, the overseer's site is the site that we've got excavation units open on. This is back in 2021 that we're doing the excavations in this area, or, or I'm sorry, 2020. This is right during the year of COVID. And then where the visitor center is up in this area, back in the day, it was this uh, stable complex. And so, you know, what we found in doing the surveys and excavations in this area is initially how we discovered this complex in this area was really through um, um, metal detector surveys. And so with these metal detector surveys, what we do is we do a combination of uh, initial 20 meter grid survey, where we cover large swaths of land to try to find where sites are. And the map for this, if you look at the uh, um, at this map right here, and I'll turn on the, the, the metal detector data, this is a, uh, um, uh, showing the grid overlaying the landscape here at Montpelier. And each of these squares are 20 meter grids. So this is approximately 66 feet by 66 feet or about a tenth of an acre. And what, what the metal detectorists do is they sweep this area and in any hits that they find, once they sample them and determine they're historic, they do a hit count. And the areas that are in red show where sites are and then it ranges down to the green, where which were probably fields where there's very little in the way of artifacts. 
So basically on this heat map right here, you can see there's a site complex in this area. Again, here's the Madison Family Cemetery right here over to the Mount Pleasant site. And then the Overseers site in this area, this is all one site in here. You've got the set of enslaved homes in this area, which are these um, uh, log structures that we've built back based on the, uh, the archaeology. And then up where the main house is, you basically have this continuous red area through here that shows this, uh, this larger site occupation. And then once the 20 meter survey is done, what we do is we switch over to the 10 foot survey. And with the 10 foot survey, what you were going for is, you know, basically um, this, uh, if you look at the this picture right here, here's the 20 meter grid. And then the 10 foot grid is probably about a, um, a 136th in terms of the, the, you know, the intensity of resolution from the 20 meter grid. And what we're able to pick up with these 10 foot grid segments is actually where the structures are. So we go from understanding where the sites are at the 20 meter grid to the 10 foot grid to understand where these site locations are. And in the process of doing this, what we're able to locate is the location of the, of the buildings and in turn the site. So for example, this site right here is what turns out to be the blacksmith site over at the, uh, the home farm complex in this area. And in this area, when we opened up units, we found you know, thousands of, um, of uh, pieces of clipped iron from the blacksmith operation, and then bags and bags of slag, which gave, made it very obvious that we had a blacksmith operation in this area. And then other sites, what we've found throughout the home farm are evidence for um, uh, a uh, threshing barn that earlier was a tobacco barn, um, to um, uh, the homes of the enslaved, where we were able to um, pick up domestic materials and then these subfloor pits that we were able to interpret as being where the locations of the buildings were. And then in amongst this area, in the area where we've, we've got the green and the, uh, the yellow, these areas were areas that were either agricultural gardens or earlier fields. And this is where Liz has been doing a lot of studies of, you know, these not only where the stable is, and in this case, this area right in here, but also the areas in between where uh, metal detectorists found horseshoes and give an indication of, you know, when this area has worked. So in this area of the, the home farm, what um, we, we found in here was primarily late 18th and early 19th century nails, very little in the way of any disturbance in the um, post-Madison period. So most of these fields in this area were plowed by, you know, horse-drawn plows. And what we found at Montpelier is so much of the landscape um, of what is today Montpelier, where the, you have fields and even the woods, you know, hasn't been touched since the uh, Dolly Madison sold the property around 1844. And so even in areas in what today are hardwoods, so for example, in the East Woods back here, what we call the East Woods, what we found are sites back in these areas that are evidence for um, uh, the kind of agriculture that was happening in this area. And so back here, for example, in the middle of the woods is we found a, uh, a threshing barn. And then on the ridge next door to it, we found evidence for a uh, tobacco barn. And so, you know, to have a threshing barn and, to and a tobacco barn in the middle of woods doesn't make any sense until you, until you realize that all this area that's woods today were fields at one time. And so, you know, when you start looking at the, what makes up Montpelier today, in many ways, you have to, to suspend what you see with your eyes to understand, you know, that, that, that being a working farm or plantation with over a hundred enslaved individuals that you would have had much larger areas that were open for um, agricultural purposes. But then through time from the 18th century into the early 19th century, these agricultural operations would have changed. And one of the, the biggest change, changes that happened with this is in the um, around the time of the American Revolution. This is when the blacksmith operation over at Montpelier 
really gets developed to a point of a very intensive operation. And so um, what we found over what today is where the temple is. So this, um, this building right here is a um, early 19th century temple built around 1811 that has an ice house below it. But immediately beside, you know, around this temple, when uh, here's a picture of Liz back in 2017 doing excavations at the ice house entrance, is one thing that we found all around the, this temple is basically this gully that was filled with slag deposits. And what these slag deposits are from is from the, and this is a, a picture of this same um, set of excavations where Liz is getting down to this 18th century layer of slag. And what we found all around the, uh, the temple is areas of intense blacksmith deposits. So this is a, a picture of one of the volunteer metal detectorists working on a 20 meter grid with the temple in the background. And this site right here, which is in terms of its location is in the flat right here, adjacent to this gully heading down to the, uh, the ice pond, is this area, there's this area of very intense blacksmith deposits that relate to this blacksmith operation that was there in the around the time of the American Revolution. And at that time, in the, in the 1770s, this is when the agricultural um, uh, uh, kind of focus changes from tobacco to mixed grains economy. And this is where you get you know, th this kind of whole scale plowing of the lands at Montpelier to recover these worn out tobacco fields that probably in many cases where the enslaved weren't able to successfully, you know, grow tobacco anymore because of the of the uh, the loss of nutrients of the soils. So what you get in this um, early 18th century, th th this uh, this period of the American Revolution, is an intensification of domestic domestication of livestock, and this combined with um, you know intensive plowing leads to just all sorts of changes across the landscape, and uh, much of the erosional uh, erosion that happened at, to the lands at Montpelier, where you get these really intense um, uh, gullies. Like, so if you're walking through the woods at Montpelier, and what I'm going to show next is this lidar map that shows this really. It's a it's a basically a a high definition um, uh, 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 elevation map to show the topography. This is the top of the ridges right here. And then in these these slopes going down to the streams, you can see these are massive erosional gullies. All these were formed in the late 18th century when you had plowing that was introduced to these top of these ridges and just, just massive changes on the soil and, and the landscape. So throughout these periods, what you've got is, you know, um, just very different um, uses of the landscape from early tobacco cultivation up into the American Revolution, from intensive plowing in the from the 1780s into the 18 teens, and then when you get into the period uh, for which we've done the restoration, which is the um, the the early 19th century, and this is where <clears throat> the house as it's restored um, was uh, present, and you've got this picturesque landscape that was on the uh the land here let me turn off the 10 foot grid here uh, there it is right here so in the early 19th century when we've got you know kind of montpelier that we recognize today with the pine alley and the grove over in this area and the, and the south yard that's built what the Madison start to do is really decrease the amount of land that's being plowed and focus on areas that are more have the enslaved focus on areas that are more flat and you get more of scientific farming and probably when you you've got um, a lot more uh, range of the kind of livestock that's present and Liz, do you have any sense of, you know, changing livestock practices from the 18th to 19th century? I know you're going to be talking about this on various tours. Yeah, I mean, um, the in well, as Madison starts to kind of um, grow in his political career, we start to see the implementation of more thoroughbreds on the property, um, more like specified breeding practices. Um, Things like that. So, um, but in terms of other livestock, I haven't looked into it too much, but um, in terms of horses, we'll definitely get into all of that um, during the program. 
Okay. Thanks, Liz. Yeah. So, I mean, the long and the short of all this is that, um, you know, to look at Montpelier and think of it just as kind of a frozen point in time dating to the 1820s when you have the the Madisons, you know, retiring back here to Montpelier, you're, you're missing a whole lot of other history that occurred both before and after. And in many cases, it's this, the post-Madison uh, history. So Dolly Madison sells the property in 1844 and following 1844, what there's some really large scale changes to the uh, operations of the plantation where the, um, the area of what we call the home farm, which is the fields below the visitor center, much of this area is abandoned. And then what is focused on in terms of developing, being developed as a farm complex is the area where um, the, uh, um, uh, where we're going to be eating dinner, which is uh, Lewis Hall, which is the old um, uh, brick stable. And where Liz is going to be giving you, you know, a tour of a lot of these buildings that are in this area. A lot of these structures were built, you know, in the, some of them were built in the 1850s, but for the most part, a lot of this area gets developed in the, um, by 1908. And so basically when the DuPonts buy the property in 1901, between 1901 and 1908 is when they have a massive building campaign to build up this, uh, this farm complex that it began to be developed in the 1850s. And what's fantastic about this area being the new farm center after 1850 is it means that much of the area that was, you know, intensively used during the Madison period, which is over in this area, is abandoned. And, and it basically remains as fields, is no longer plowed, and it remains as this, you know, set of stable archaeological sites that we, we, we've been exploring over the past two decades and will continue to explore. And then what gets really developed is this area in here, starting in the 1850s, that when the DuPonts bought, purchased the land in 1901, they continue to develop with all these buildings through here. And I'll go ahead and share um, some of these maps with you all so you can explore these. I've got, we've got a story map that goes into how to, how to use these GIS maps, you know, and click on a lot of these buildings, everything from what, we, what today is the Gupton Library that we're using as a temporary lab um, while we're um, uh, rebuilding, you know, the new lab we're going to have across on Route 20 at the store to um, areas of like what's the schooling barn that lives will bring you into that was a prominent part of this equestrian history in the early 19th and mid 20th century. And then um, some of the other buildings that uh, are a favorite, like the old lab from before 2008, that was our archaeology lab that then before that time was the um, was the uh, uh, the cookhouse for a lot of the DuPont workers. So uh, what you know, what you see of Montpelier today, you know, outside of the visitor core is this, this DuPont landscape. And um, for, uh, you know, as Liz will get into, so much of the history of Montpelier, you know, before 1929, for example, William DuPont, you know, didn't, it, it was at that time that William DuPont didn't allow any motor vehicles on the property, right, Liz? Yeah, and then afterwards, when Marion Dupont Scott, his daughter, you know, paved the roads, then she turns it into a horse farm. So there's just so much of this history to explore. And what Liz is doing with her work on her dissertation is really giving us this really broad context for, you know, how the landscape that we see today was so much influenced by, you know, what was needed for having horses to both work the land for um, uh, uh, equestrian activities that we think of today. But then behind all this, you know, the people that would have made this possible, which were, you know, the, the African-American community, both during the period of enslavement and after, who were such a major part of this, uh, this industry and landscape. So that's really an overview of the property. And we're, um, uh, I can't, Liz, are, are Rick and Lori staying on the property? Are they in one of the houses? They are staying in the village, yeah. Okay, yeah. So do you know what houses they're staying in? I don't, but I will find out. 
Okay. Yeah. You're Liz will get back to you on what building you're staying in, but the village is all this area through here, which consists of, um, of house seven, house eight right here, nine, 10, and then 11. And when you all are here, there's going to be um, a lot of other guests on the property as well. Probably some board members and other folks coming to the races. And then um, uh, one of the other, uh, are you you all going to visit Arlington House, Liz, as part of the tours? I don't think so, no. So I know, um, Vivian, you're staying over in Arlington House, right? Oh, you're muted, Vivian. Okay, I think, yeah, you're staying over in Arlington House, Vivian. Arlington House is, uh, is another um, uh, part of the property that originally was a plantation complex here at Montpelier that was owned by the Newman family. And so, you know, at Montpelier, we've just not, not, not only have the Madison owned lands during the period of enslavement, but adjacent plantations that creates this, this incredible, incredibly rich mosaic of, uh, of homes and sites across the property. But um, what I'll do is um, go ahead and stop sharing, uh, sharing screens here. Yeah. And uh, but uh, I'll I'll send uh, kind of a, some of the, um, the the readings that help they'll help flesh out. Hi, Jane. How are you doing? <laughs> I'll send some of the readings that will help flesh out some of this really broad overview that I've given here. But, you know, rather than getting into a lot of the details in this call, you know, just wanted to give you kind of an overview of some of this history. So, um, Liz, do you have anything else to add with this? Just that um, we'll see everybody for dinner at five o'clock on Wednesday, uh, Wednesday, next week, Wednesday over. And we're going to have that dinner. If it, the weather's nice, we'll do it on the patio uh, behind Lewis Hall. But um, otherwise, uh, we'll do it in, inside Lewis Hall. Yeah. And I think I sent you all a map, a Google map showing where Lewis Hall is. But if you have any questions, uh, let us know. And when you get uh, for um, uh, Lori and Rick, when you all arrive, uh, probably around quarter of five, the gate will be locked. So you need to use the code. And uh, you probably, have there. I don't know which code you're given, but there's 4141 star and then 1101 star. Any of those will uh, work. We periodically renew the codes, but then never delete the old codes. So it, it works out to everybody's benefit. So I think some of these cold codes are, might be as old as some of the field school students we've had. So, but uh, well, great. We'll look forward to seeing you all. And uh, Vivian, thanks for being on the call. And uh, Jane, I've got your tickets. I'm going to bring them over uh, uh, after this. We so. need to talk. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Well, bye, everybody. Okay.